Hello and welcome to the 51st Radical Poetry Reading. I'm Malvika Jolly, Special Projects Associate here at The Rail, and today I have the pleasure and privilege of welcoming writer and translator Forrest Gander, who has lovingly curated a fantastic lineup of poets and readers for us today, featuring Vivri Francis, Ranjit Hoskote, David Shook, and Rosemary Waldrop. We've started all of our events here with two important acknowledgements. The first is that here in New York, we're on Lenapahoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsi, Munsi, and Lenni Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and the Shinnecock Indian Nation. The second is an acknowledgement that Black Lives Matter. And I think it's worth taking a moment to remind ourselves that the heart of both of these acknowledgements is a commitment to the liberation of the oppressed and solidarity for all those who struggle in freedom in recognition that when it comes to our liberation, our histories never unfold in isolation, that thought coming uh, from the phenomenal Angela Davis. In that spirit, I encourage you all to check out the chat where I'll post very shortly a living document of resources and actions we've been putting together here at The Rail. Uh, but now it's my honor to welcome our wonderful curator, poet laureate of hearts and minds, Forrest Gander. <laughs> Good chuckle. Uh, was born in the Mojave Desert and lives in Northern California, where he has a home being rapidly unpacked as we speak, waiting for him in the Sonoma Mountains. A writer and translator with degrees in geology and literature, his books often concern themselves with questions of ecology and include Be With, which came out with New Directions in 2018, and also uh, in the following year won the 2019 Pulitzer Prize. They also include the novel The Trace, which came out with New Directions as well in 2014, which a few of us at the Rail staff uh, are reading presently. Uh, and Twice Alive, which came out just earlier this year with New Directions. Uh, he was most recently on the Rail just last month as part of our publishing and transit series on New Directions Press, and for which he read to us from the title series of his latest uh, book, Twice Alive, by marking the transition from one stanza to the next, not with a pause, but with a shattering smack of his hand on the table, inspiring over the past month so, so many conversations on how what we really truly want from our poems is that much more primordial thing, to be terrified, to be startled, to have decorum utterly violated, and how that is the same thing as to be delighted. Uh, without further ado, Forrest, take it away. Wow. That was a terrific introduction, Malvika. Thank you. And thank you for organizing this. And thank you, Fong and Nick. It is, um, it is an extraordinary group of uh, poets who are going to read now from um, all over. Uh, and in fact, uh, what time is it where, uh, where you are, Renjit? It's, uh, it's 10.30 in the night, actually, Boris. Oh, OK, good, good. <laughs> It's about when Rosemary wakes up. Um, <laughs> uh, so um, I thought I would start this um, reading. <clears throat> I, I wanted to note also that each of the, uh, the poets reading today has a um, new book, either just out or coming out soon. Um, and I thought I'd start out with a sort of invocation uh, by George Oppen called Psalm. Veritas Sequitur, in the small beauty of the forest, the wild deer bedding down, that they are there, their eyes effortless, the soft lips nuzzle, and the alien small teeth tear at the grass. The roots of it dangle from their mouths, scattering earth in the strange woods. They who are there, their paths, nibbled through the fields, the leaves that shade them, hang in the distances of sun, the small nouns crying faith in this in which the wild deer startle and stare out. We're going to start with Vivi Francis, who escaped North Texas from Michigan and later North Carolina Eventually, she was lured to New Hampshire to accept a professorship at Dartmouth College. But her three books of poetry emphasize that no one ever really escapes from the circumstance of personal or cultural histories. Her most recent book is Forest Primeval, that's with one R, but a much anticipated new volume, The Shared World, is coming out in January. She's the 2021 recipient the recipient of the Aiken Taylor Award for Modern American Poetry, and also 
uh, of the Kingsley Tufts Award. Take it away, Vivi. Thank you, Forrest, and um, thank you, Brooklyn Rail, and it's uh, wonderful to be reading with um, all of you. I'm going to start with a poem entitled To Forget. Uh, there's an epigraph, O oh pain, O oh pain, time eats life and the dark enemy that gnaws at our hearts, Baudelaire. Welcome the enemy back with flags of forgetfulness. Let the children go forward yelping as innocents so often do. Make a line, stand in the old formation, believe, believe. The cells are empty, flesh gone, bones buried, unrecognizable. How well the enemy looks, no longer gaunt, so plump as if something young were had for breakfast. Look, a pick in the tooth, hooray. Bring the enemy back at night by boat or plane. Allow the enemy the crossing. Let them make a grand entrance on the square in the light of the morning, in clean white clothes and a handkerchief at the side of the mouth. Let us forgive as the books would have us do. So what the dead past? Only the old dare remember and they are without teeth. So be it, the gone, gone. Hasn't the enemy been through enough? Wasn't the enemy there? Break me and I'll sing. My voice like marrow, a blood yolk spilled upon the counter. You can't stop this song. More hands than yours have closed around my throat. You may crack me, you have cracked me. I'm frightened, but so what? I'll testify. Witness, if you can, listen. I slurped the frog leg soup gone bad, held a brass spoon like a barrel to my mouth. I could tell you what you want to hear, but I'd be broken just the same, so why not sing it? I'm singing now, louder this time, and in the round. We are a wounding of red plume birds, every voice a bloody feather in the bone crown. When your brother dies, you want. Nothing more than to be held by your brother and within that absence to be held by any other, it will take that to cry it through. And if there is no one to do so, if there's an embrace, but it does not last long enough, you, ne you may never feel the joy of wailing. Instead, you may hold that cry for years until no one knew you ever needed to cry at all. Until you believe you are free of tears, until one day standing at the sink, the water running hot over your knuckles, you double over and that long held cry escapes in a gasp, a memory of that other body in convulsion, the sick bed or the street, the smell of death so close, you forget there are people with you in the room and you almost let go before you are reminded that day is done and there is work before you to do. So you straighten up and continue to do whatever it was you were doing close the valve of ache and swallow whatever came up. The shared world. Into the bow of your ear, I whispered the secret story. Now you can't sleep either. Consider it part of your own memory connecting our childhoods that would have otherwise never crossed. I fell down, your knee was scraped. I stuffed the yellow cake into my mouth and your stomach cramped. When you were abandoned, grief filled my well. The private ravages of our spent youth and adulthood now implicitly intimate. You pull me to you because I have already softened your sharp elbows. The pressure of your fingers in my shoulder leaves an impression as if in need I had touched myself. We are insomniacs. 
the grip of night freeing us from the slept through day and its demands. It is true, once you know, you can't unknow. So we ruminate on literature and the gods and continually seek to empty the jug. But we need no wine, really. We're eager to get on with it, to take in or do whatever forwards this living, this tripwire keeping us tied, string to kite, present to past, arrow to quiver. Given to rust. Every time I open my mouth, my teeth reveal more than I mean to. I can't stop tonguing them, my teeth, almost giddy to know they're still there. My mother lost hers by this age, but I am embarrassed nonetheless that even they aren't pretty. Still, I did once like my voice, the way it moved through the gap in my teeth like bird song in morning, like the slow swirl of a creek at dusk. Just yesterday, a woman closed her eyes as I read aloud and said she wanted to sleep in the sound of it, my voice. I can still sing some. Early cancer didn't stop the compulsion to sing, but there's gravel now, an undercurrent that reveals me, time and disaster, a landslide down the mountain. When you stopped speaking to me, what you really wanted was for me to stop speaking to you, to stifle the sound of my voice, I know. Didn't want the quicksilver of it in your ear, what does it mean to stifle another, to silence another? It means I ruminate on the hit of rain against the tin roof of childhood. How I could listen all day until the water rusted its way in. And there I was, putting a pan over here and a pot over there to catch it. Thank you. I was saying fantastic, Vivi. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, Ranjit Haskote is one of the most prolific and exciting contemporary Indian poets writing in English and a translator from Marathi. He's also, a well, he's also well known as a cultural and art critic, a curator and a political activist. Hunch Prose, his deeply affecting recent book of poems, chronicles the passions of displaced men and women and animals digging through history for their own traces. In 2004, at the preposterous age of 35, Hascote was awarded a Lifetime Achievement Award from India's National Academy of, of uh, Letters. Ranjit, welcome. Thank you so much, Forrest. And uh, I really want to thank you for this invitation. And I want to thank Brooklyn Rail and Malvika, Nick, and the team. It's, it's very special to be reading with, with all of you here. I thought what I might do is to begin with two island poems. I live on an island, uh, Bombay, with a strange colonial history. It once was part of the dowry of a Portuguese princess who married, uh, married Charles II of England, actually. So I thought I'll begin by thinking back to this strange and entangled history. Uh, this is a poem called Highway Prayer. And it's from, uh, from the Atlas of Lost Beliefs. If you're writing a fresh anthem for the one scorched island marooned in cyclone country. Be sure to put in a line about burnt tires and sleeping dogs. And another line on the flags, curtains, TV screens, more flags, all the shrouds the islanders are hanging up to protect themselves from the world. They need a savior. That'll be the man in the red raincoat falling through an open door. An unseen hand stops him, props him up. He blocks the door, a crucifix barring the passage of time. 
Time burns right through him. He clutches at his burst stomach, crouching on the sidewalk, holding fast to the creased memory of a river he once loved. In him, the shimmer is great, greater than panic greater than the fear of flies, of stakes, of exploding shells, of ending up as roadkill. Tongue-tied, he reads this rosetta of violence, this highway across which sirens call to knotted prophets, batmen to jokers, jets to sharks. Bless me ivories, the land pirate says, at last shiver me timbers. In this place that found me empty, in this place that found me parched, I am blood, I am grief, I am the returning rocket, I am contrary to the commonwealth. Lord of the booming antlers on a yellow signboard, let go, he calls out, let go. Craft me into this totality that never closes. And I'll follow that up with a modest reworking of Shakespeare's Tempest achieved in 14 lines. With some of the characters flipped around, you'll recognize them all. It's called Sycorax. Woke up trapped in a tree trunk Speech slurred, though all I'd drunk was berry blood. It must have been the old man with his cursed and cursing stick, which spanned my rainbow shored island in tight, cunning sweeps. Swamps, jungles, rivers, all measured in leaps and leached, cropped, damned to suit his will. The magus in his coracle, his eye fixed on the kill. He has caged my bright-billed birds in new names, mapped ash from his crucible across the flames of my volcano, tamped it down. My skin is bark on which his steaming slaves will carve his dark memoirs of war. He will claim eternity as his own raise his monument on my stabbed muscles, my powdered bones. And I'll move now from thinking about islands and their place in this larger history of the colonial to a poem called Man with Parrots. A man with two caged parrots waits for a megaphone to screech. He is flying out of a monsoon. He will land where it never rains. The man does not belong to himself. He did not script himself. He is the residue of his fingerprints. He is who, is who his iris says he is. He has been recorded as a wavering image, opening and closing his mouth in ritual sequences that suggest speech. He's been waved through, no one speaks to him. He drags his minefield around with him, clearing a track through safe zones. He does not know that the sun will burn through his skin as he builds a pyramid in which they will show images of people like him building pyramids as the sun burns through their skin. Not Jin, not ghoul, he is Scan, he is Kota, he is number, he won't feel the rain on his skin for three years, he will have nowhere to go. Town. In this town, ask for directions in whispers. Tell no one your birth name. Say you're on your way to nightfall. Buy more bread than you'll eat. Read the signboards forwards and back. Mimic the rare songbird hiding in a bush. Stride along the pipeline bridging the creek. Shuffle off the linen strap on the Kevlar. Play infidel on the hill, believer on the beach, because one blue is so much closer to us than the other 
on your knees in the stand. And when it's time, pray you'll come back as pearl thread surf, not driftwood in this town. Now a poem called Market, and it goes like this. Never forget the salt makers, they can trap the sea. Never forget the makers of flint knives, they can split the earth. Never forget the spice sellers, they can tempt the tongue to sing. Never forget the kite makers, they can scissor the wind into streamers. Never forget the carpenters, they can build horses that breach walled cities. Never forget those who stretch hide into leather. They can craft drums that bring down palaces. A poem now called Hawk, which really was a way of responding to the kinds of politics of divisiveness and polarization that we've seen and suffered in South Asia in the last two or three decades but applicable pretty much everywhere. Hawk, caught up on the wave of the past, a hawk skirls back, ripping the seamed and sutured scar of our passage. Its wings are lined with scripts no one can read, but everyone brawls over. In this city of howling dogs and winning saints, the blood that spurts under its claws is common. The sort you could smell anywhere, the sort you can smell everywhere. Suffer us all, dear God of many names, to come together and feed ourselves to that insatiable beak. And I'll end with a poem called Letters from Ugarit. Ugarit was a Bronze Age port city in the north of what is today Syria, or pieces of Syria anyway. And uh, it's a way of thinking back to where the alphabet began, without which we, of course, would be nowhere. Letters from Ugarit. Fire saved these words, cut into clay, corded sounds of desert and surf gouged into flesh. Father, look the enemies, ships, the sea, people, my cities torched. These words saved no one, not sender, not receiver. My country burning, my chariots lost, words that did not carry across the numb sand. Your messenger saw our threshing floors, charred our vineyards ripped up from their roots. Messenger, we could have been howling on the moon's far side. With his barbed whip, Marduk cut down my guardian angel. He broke my shield. He drove me from my house. No one heard, no one cried when they heard these baked sounds other hands would draw and fit into tamer molds. Alpu, Betu, Gamu, ox, house, camel. Recording barrels and bales, Marduk pull me from the river, listing sails and hulls. Marduk let this cloud pass, sounds that have rung through every changing, trembling shape. Even when the reed breaks, the ink fades, and there is no moon, save these words. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ranjit. Um, that's a, a harrowing sequence of poems. And uh, the, the Sycorax sonnet uh, makes me think of another poet who wrote about uh, colonialism um, and who called his own style Sycorax. And that's uh, Kamau Brathwaite. You know him, but absolutely, yes, indeed. Boy. Thank you. Our next reader is Rosemary Waldrop. Rosemary Waldrop's profound and newest uh, book of poems 
is the nick of time, which comes as her poetry always comes in the nick of time and is concerned among other things with elegy, the tenderness of love, gravity and aging across Scandinavia and Central Europe and in the hearts of many Americans, Waldrop is celebrated as one of America's most significant innovative writers, translators, and editors. Her poetry is formally probing, politically implicative, humorous, playful, and philosophical, usually all at once. With her husband and collaborator, Keith Waldrop, she ran the press burning deck for more than 30 years. I think it was quite a bit more than 30 years, Rosemary, was it? Um, I think it was more like 50. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Thank you, Forrest, for this introduction. And, and thank the Brooklyn Drain and thank all of you for being here and reading with me. <clears throat> I'll read from this new book called The Nick of Time. <clears throat> And I'll start with a reading from a sequence called The Almost Audible Passing of Time. I've been sitting so still, I might be part of the garden. Time might shut down. If I weren't still cultivating an edge of desire, its thirst, its burst toward the region of expectation the way a hungry baby stretches its arms toward the mother's breast, or the cat keeps eyeing the grackles, black as if already night. The pale moon hangs ready for her cue, so shallow sunlight is still sinking through the air. The future, surprising we can think of it, its uncertain contours, body, mass, when the ads all announce end of season sales. The garden, in fact, lies behind me, is nothing but an act of memory. Along with the dry smell of a stone ball crumbling at the point where sky and earth would come together. All our temporal concepts can be traced, it is said, to feelings of effort and fatigue just as it takes learning and failure to become aware of our capacities, encouraged with luck by a mother's smile. But can I look at a word as if I hadn't learned to read? We're still running through high grass, smelling the sluggish mine river mingled with distance and the lilac purple. The day all dew and dawn, dusting sleep from bird wings. Even so your nose is in your book, I can just see you roll your eyes at such silly questions. Ritual, repetition, rhyme. For centuries we've tried to thwart the arrow. But even when at the prayer of Joshua, the sun stood still, time nevertheless continued. Likewise, when Rousseau to tossed his watch, Staring at the mottled bark of the sycamore, do I think this ritual will protect me from the constant changes in my body? The run toward dust to dust? Is it to freeze this moment before the mosquitoes come with their cargo of itches that I watch beetles and reeds and pods as if I were interested in them? But I don't even know their name when words and their entanglements are my fearless. Without them, I'm in darkness. I search the cracks between my English and German for more words than either has to gather the gradations in softness of the late afternoon air, as if they could help my nerve impulses not to fire on the all or none principle like our elections, but to transmit even the slightest discrepancies of light, the weakest hum of the insect. But even so, the leaves soften the edges of the tree. The alphabet takes many American minutes to take the place of one look. And it's the pale moon between the leaves, not a symbol that triggers the image of a German farm lost 
in strata of time, solar, sidereal, nuclear, where the pale light stretched out the distance and the cows chewed their cut so slowly, immeasurable by any clock. A different time, not suited to the ephemeral. The instant of late sun on my hands feels worth two birds out of reach on which the cat's attention is riveted. My attention wanders, not by hops and jumps, but alternate diffusion and concentration like the foot of a snail. As if thinking were a method of scratching on these clumps of earth and I could grab a fistful in order to hold on the way I press words deep into the paper. Do I hope the breaks between them will interrupt if not beat time? The way thinking of the cows enlarges the small plot into a plane because cows move slowly and in the distance. I chase my little thoughts around a circle the way the cat chases her tail. So more often she leaps into the nick of the kill. Once upon a time, I spoke my mother's tongue, lake, pond, deep river, sea. And the wake of a ship showed not only the churn of water behind it, but the yet unrealized advance about to happen. Then suddenly I was an old woman enveloped by evening cool. The waning light damp on the skin makes the yard less spacious, less direct than the remembered garden. I'm not a virtuoso of stillness like the cat, but feel the lightness born of fatigue, of words that say nothing but hang in the air like echoes, or positive joy. And I'd like to end with a poem from the sequence symptoms, uh, rehearsing the symptoms, and it's called doing. I often don't know what to do, or if I want to. Dawn has long broken while I still drag my feet in the mud inside my head, hope for coffee, make a B-flat moan to prepare the plunge into action. Why not? Maybe I want to cast only a passing shadow, feel like my mother's, thank God, when she took off her closet. But I am worried there's something I ought to be doing, afraid I'll die without having done anything. Realized myself, you call it, but wouldn't that just mean limited myself? A cement mixer stuck in one motion, even if it helps build a her house? So I delude myself into thinking I'm doing something when thinking, or when descending into the night with the cat and the dreams of the cat. You say, no doing without sweat of the face, thorns and thistles and bringing forth children. Should I look instead of worrying about fine distinctions that escape my eyes? Listen instead of fretting about the size of my ears? but can I cultivate my garden without becoming a cabbage head? The hand gets ready to write. Could we not call this manual labor or a stage in the great work of rendering the corporeal cat incorporeal while giving her body to the bodies of the, of the bodiless world, even if it's from despairing of my own body? You say, my writing is so slow, it's more like gravitational condensation or dust gathering on the cleaning supplies. It's true, I'm dawdling as if I had time to watch the formation of geological layers. So night already seeps through my brittle bones. I certainly don't know what to do to end my days gracefully. But the body dies all through our life, thousands of cells every second. So everything should be very clear. 
Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, interesting how those poems in that uh, sequence, the rehearsing the symptoms um, with the mysterious you and I, re remind me, um, Vivi, of, uh, of the title poem in your collection with the, um, with the ambiguous relationship between you and I and how, how I want to ask you about that later. And Rosemary, what you call the, um, the mud in your head is right where I want my anchor to stick. <laughs> Thank you for that reading. Thank you. David Shook, author of Our Obsidian Tongues, is the charismatic poet, prolific multi-language translator and international filmmaker who also serves as the founding editor of Phoneme Media. With their roots in Mexico, Los Angeles, and now Northern California, and with an astonishing range of international literary passions, they have become deeply involved in the last few years with Kashkul, a center for arts and culture at the American University of Iraq, founded by poet translator Alana Marie Levinson Labras. Shook's translation of Beauty Salon, the iconic book by Mexican writer Mario Bellatin, is soon to be released by Deep Vellum. And their own forthcoming book, Shook's own forthcoming book of poems in Spanish and English is called Atlas Estelar. Wow, thank you, Forrest. That was beautiful, if hyperbolic. I'm very grateful to you for, for inviting me to participate in today's reading and just, it, it feels like a real privilege to sit here on Zoom among such incredible company. So thank you, my fellow poets and to the organizers at Brooklyn Rail. I'm going to start today reading an excerpt from my manuscript in progress, as Forrest mentioned, it's called Atlas Estelar, and it's a book that I began writing in, in Spanish, not because I intended to, just because that's, that's how it came out when I was thinking about, about the things it was about and when I was the places I, I began writing it. And this is a book that I've been, been working on now for the better, the better part of a decade, showing very few my work in progress, although Forrest has a particularly compelling manner of, of wrangling a bit of a, a manuscript out of your, uh, your hands, no matter how tightly pride shut they are. So I'm going to read two sections from the book. It's a, a book that's very spare there. It's really a book length poem or, or cycle. And the sections I'm going to read, I'm going to read them first in Spanish, and then in English. And the, the first translation into English, the, the first section I just translated this morning. And the, the second section was actually translated by Forrest for publication and, and a special edition of a magazine uh, from up here in the Bay Area that he put together last year. So thanks again, Forrest. Without further ado, here is a bit of poetry from Atlas Estelar. El desierto como mar, pero no es mar. El desierto como mar sin olas. El desierto como mar sin gaviotas. El desierto como mar sin marea. Botellas de plástico fundidas secadas en la arena como conchas de ultramar. El desierto como mar, navegado con el cielo como mapa. El desierto como mar, que come navegantes perdidos. Desert like a sea, but not a sea. Desert like a waveless sea. Desert like a birdless sea. Desert like a tideless sea. 
plastic bottles melted, dried in the sand like alien shells. Desert like a sea, traversed with the sky as a map. Desert like a sea that swallows lost farers. En el sur de mi país tenemos un muro visible desde el espacio con un grosor de 2,000 kilómetros cuadrados, más implacable que cualquier construcción humana. En el sur de mi país tenemos zoológicos humanos con familias enteras enjauladas, juntas para observación. Zoológicos especializados para las crías. En el sur de mi país tenemos cazadores que no distinguen entre ciervo y cervato. ¿Y por qué les importaría si todo movimiento por el desierto es de animal? In the south of my country, we have a wall visible from space and 2,000 kilometers thick, more implacable than any other human contrivance. In the south of my country, we have human zoos with entire families caged together for observation, specialized zoos for their offspring. In the south of my country, we have hunters who don't distinguish between deer and fawn. And why would they care if it's only animals that move through the desert? So thank you again, Forrest, for your encouragement, for your translation of that second section. I'm going to transition by reading a poem by one of my favorite poets, the Nicaraguan Joaquin Pasos, who died at age 32 in 1947 before publishing a, a single book of his own work. Pasos was a virtuosic and kind of widely ranging poet. And one of his, his more eclectic projects and, and one that I think has not been remembered as it, it ought to be, having, having been conducted in the you know, early to mid forties, is a sequence of poems he wrote in English, a language he had never formally studied. And the, the sequence of 11 poems is called Poemas de un joven que no sabe inglés, poems by a young man who doesn't know English. And as you'll see there, I think they're spectacular. They're a kind of inversion of the, the kind of prophetic authoritative tone of much of, of Paso Spanish language poetry. This one is called Things to Welcome Love. Love will call to you someday in June. Your lonely garden must be quiet and arranged as if you were to die in solitude. You must be dressed in an old pink gown, a burial robe, just like a wedding one, because love and death are so near and so far. Your lonely garden must be full of bees. The lilies must be gathered in your arms. Then you will sit and wait under the trees. Oh, please, a moment. Something is missing in the place. Under a tree, a table must be set. A table with more flowers and a book, a silver bell and a teacup. Let us hang violins from the highest branches. Let us forget the moon. Love will come here riding on a bicycle as softly as this quiet afternoon. What more? More flowers, yes. More flowers on the benches and a little scholar smile to dance with the music lesson of your eyes. Love will call to you some day of these. 
Maybe he is coming now. You fix my tie and we shall sit and wait under the trees. What a great ear for, for, for English. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty spectacular. And, and you know, as a, I, I wonder if this isn't true of you, uh, Forrest, and of our other translators in the audience, but the, the poetry, you know, written at the, the edges of, of language or in the margins or in the spaces between language to be the most exciting, the most thrilling, the, the opportunities we, we best have to see how language is evolving and changing and how it can be made one's own. So Pasos, uh, yeah, I highly recommend that sequence of poems, Poemas de un joven que no sabe inglés, which you can find online. Along with some of my translations of his work into, into Spanish, or from Spanish rather, into English, if, if you're interested. I'm gonna read another poem of my own now. And this poem began in correspondence. One of the, the silver linings to the last couple of years for me has been the, the richness of, of many of my correspondences, particularly with writers based elsewhere. And one of them in particular has been a, a relationship with the Cabo Verdean poet, Jorge Carlos Fonseca whose work I've been translating for a while. And he sends me these, these kind of paragraph length missives, you know, every few days in Portuguese. And sometimes I, I'll respond, other times I'll just read them. This poem in, in particular, I wanted to read today because it is the, the first birthday of my first child. And I wrote this poem very, early in, in Lyle's life, perhaps the, the first or second month they were live when I was waking up every morning at about five and, and taking the first morning shift. And at the time I thought, oh, this is great. I'm so inspired to write poems. I, I now realize that was psychosis from lack of sleep. And uh, it was not quite as productive a poem writing period as I had uh, at one moment anticipated. But I wrote this poem with the baby one morning, looking out over the, the bay where we live at the sunrise. And it's called Obad with Baby. And I actually translated it from, from Portuguese this morning, as it was one of the responses to one of those poems by Fonseca. Obad with baby. The sky spits its pink across the southern horizon. In the bay, along the inverted furrows of aquaculture where the oysters swell, hundreds of migrating birds perch, beads, on an abacus. How much time have I wasted counting fleeting things? In the lazy vocabulary of English, the bivalves grow in their beds, though the oysters never fall asleep. How high will I teach you to count? A dozen beads take flight toward warmer climes black flecks on a thin sliver of salmon, and which tallies to keep. Eventually, they disappear, like everything. These winged beads, this pink, the small eternity we share in the morning's chill. So happy birthday, Lyle. And thank you so much, Forrest, and, and to my fellow poets who have really inspired me a lot this morning. Thank you, David. That, um, that line, did I get it right? How much time have I wasted chasing fleeting things? Um, counting, counting fleeting things. Counting fleeting things. That actually reminds me of a line that uh, from Rosemary's book that she was talking about also about so chasing the things in her mind like a cat around, you know, mm -hmm. after its tail. Um, 
Well, that was fabulous. Do we, uh, Malvika, do we uh, have a little uh, cross discussion time now? Don't or cross, but we uh -huh. certainly do. Um, so, you know, I'll just hand you the mic for us. You can take us, take us on a ride. Well, Vivi, I did want to get back to that, um, that question to you about the, the title poem um, of, your, uh, of your forthcoming book. And that um, the, the way I heard that poem or the way it was making its meaning for me um, had to do with, it, it seemed to be that the I was constructed of, was constructed out of a relationship with a you that was also the I, sort of um, beyond the, um, the polarity of like Buber's I thou, it's like we are, we are all part of each other. Is that, is that a, kind of uh, philosophical trajectory in the book or? It is. And um, part of what I want to say in the book, um, we can't escape each other. I mean, I mean we're, we're social creatures and I'm pretty reclusive and yet still I have to have people near around at some point. Um, so I, I take the title from Naomi Shiobnai's uh, uh, from a Naomi Shibnai poem uh, where uh, people are at the airport and there are differences, but uh, how, do you, how do you find a way to each other through difference or through similarity, but that we have to find a way to each other to make this thing work is, is, utter, is of utmost importance, especially right now. Um, although I'm not um, one of those people who thinks that we're all the same, I, I, that reduces me. I, I like to tell my students when they say I only see one color, I say, oh, you miss all of this delicious brownness. You know, <laughs> I don't want to get rid of it. You know, <laughs> I like it. So, yeah. um, so just all kinds of explorations of where, where we touch each other and, the, and what happens if we don't. Mm -hmm. Did I answer that question? Yeah, beautifully, <laughs> beautifully. Um, uh, uh, Ranjit, you preceded a, a, a poem that you read by talking about the uh, tumultuous times in India. And you said, surprising me, over the last, um, I think, two or three decades. And I was thinking over the last two or 3,000 years. Um, what um, what in particular, I mean, in Modi is even more recent, what, what defines the last two or three decades there for you as the, as the particular tumult that you are addressing? I think what we've experienced in these last 30 years or so, uh, Forrest, is the coming apart of, um, of, of the kinds of connections that held communities together, overriding differences. I'm not painting an idyllic picture of what we had before, but just in the weave of the everyday, for instance, uh, there wasn't this playing up of religious and ethnic and caste differences. Uh, the politicization of these identities by the forces of reaction, really. Mm -hmm. So that to me is, is the greatest threat. It's what's pulling Indian society apart. And as someone who's grown up in a more liberal, inclusive uh, ethos, it's, uh, it's terrible to now pass through this time of, of hard-edged identities that are in collision, uh, powerful majoritarian impulse that would annihilate the other. This is, this is where our politics is going. And so that poem that I read, Hawk, is really about uh, how you have a situation of great plurality and you then proceed to make a complete mess of it because you want to think in terms of monocultures. Uh -huh. And that's something you've been writing about, not just in your poetry, but in essays. Um... Yeah, Ilya Troyanov, who's a German novelist and a dear friend. Uh, Ilya and I wrote a book together called uh, Kampfatsage, uh, Confluences in English, uh, which really looked at this question of how in fact, historically, we've been created out of entanglements and cusps and blurs and uh, forms of hybridity and curiosity and exploration. 
all of these things that are put to one side by, you know, rhetoric that tells us that um, we need to only remain narrowly constricted within our self-sufficient identities. It's uh, rhetoric that cuts against risk, against curiosity, against opening yourself to the other and being responsive to the other. Uh -huh. I love that forms of hybridity, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and David, that's, uh, that's been both your and Rosemary's um, sort of modus operandi is forms of hybridity. Uh, Rosemary calls gap gardening sort of in the between, the entanglement between um, um, margins. Do either of you want to want to speak to that? I'd love to hear Rosemary speak about it. <laughs> Rosemary, I'm also asking you to unmute. Um, I know we've had a couple of technical. There we go. OK, um, I lost power for a while. And when I came back in, I couldn't unmute myself. <laughs> but so here I am. Um, but now I've lost, you know, <laughs> I've lost my thread over this technological uh, snag. Uh, so what was, what was talking it? about? Um, uh, Ranjit was talking about um, the uh, s social mm -hmm. and and sort of lexical hybridity versus um, a sort of total totalitarianism. Right. And yeah. Well, well, Ranji does it with this great, uh, with this great scope, uh, historical and political scope. Uh, you know what I do with hybridity or such is on a very much smaller scale, but um, but everything comes of hybridity comes of uh, contact with other things. In fact, um, well, most of my poems use collage mixing usually collage and my own lines. But um, I do that in order to let other voices come in. And I came to it because when I first write it, started to write poems, they were all about my mother and my difficult <laughs> relation with her. And I thought, uh, you know, even I myself saw that these poems were boring. <laughs> and so I decided to take a couple books and take like three words from every page or some little device like that. And so I made little structures which I thought were objective and were quite outside myself and then put them aside. And then when I reread them four weeks later, they were still about my mother. <laughs> <laughs> but, but also something else was going on. So I realized uh, that collage is a great way of getting out of myself and letting other voices come in, other, other areas of expertise. I, I quote a lot of physics, not that I understand you know, the, the quantum physics, but it, they have a great vocabulary for one thing. And what little I understand uh, is fascinating because you know, the, our image of the world has been changing so radically. Uh, since you know the atom and then the quantum, uh, it's uh, it's dizzying, you know. And um, so I use collage uh, to get a wider range. And sometimes it gets worked out again over the poem, and sometimes it stays. And I think uh, the clash between them. I mean, the I like the edges. I like the seams. I don't like try to make it seamless. Like I think the seams are important to signal that there are other things coming in, other voices, other things. And um, well, they're not alone. <laughs> we're a community, yeah. And we can't shut anything out, really. So that's. Yeah, sort of just what Vivi said too, and uh, and David, your work is in constant dialogue with otherness right. and um, and using the voice of others also. 
uh, in your own work and as part of the imagination of what literature is for you, no? Yeah, I think that's true, Forrest. And, and as Rosemary was talking, I, I couldn't help but think about, I mean, translation as I understand it, as, as I see it in my own writerly practice is, it is a form of writing. And, and what it is is a, a form of writing in that hybrid space between one person's language and, and another's. Um, so yeah, I think, I think that's right on. That's a, a very good observation, Forrest. And, and I know you as a, a translator and, and someone with whom I occasionally text about the uh, finer points of the Spanish language. Uh, that's, that's very much a, a liminal space you, you have inhabited as well. Ranjit, have you been influenced by the You've you've but you've translated not just from the Marathi but from other languages also, and what kind of relationship has that had with your own writing? An absolutely dynamic and nourishing relationship, actually. Uh, Forest uh, the Marathi translation is actually a very long time ago. I haven't really gone back to it, but I spent many many years working on a 14th century Kashmiri woman mystic. Laldir. Right, yeah. So my, that was the, so if anything, it's really been Kashmiri and Urdu for me. More recently, I've been working with this uh, 18th century uh, Urdu poet called Mir Takimir. So these experiences have been absolutely special and, and seminal to me. I think they've actually uh, helped me open up, loosen up my own use of language because Anglophone poets in India, as you might know, tend to have been for a long time in a kind of historically defensive kind of place because the language was long associated with the colonial power. Uh, so many of us, at least in my generation, we grew up with the sense that we have to defend our linguistic turf against all of this nativist opposition. And gradually at the ripe old age of uh, whatever it was in my late forties and now getting on to 52, I just said to myself, you know, this is a complete waste of time. I'm a multilingual speaker for all kinds of reasons of South Asian diaspora, I have access to multiple languages. I'm just being silly, not letting them feed into what I do. So it's really helped in all kinds of artisanal ways, not, not just at the level of theory and ideology. It's, you know, how do you open up syntax? How do you bring in this diaphaneity of Urdu, for instance, certain tonality? It's, it's really been liberating in, in, in many ways. Thanks. If you don't mind my jumping in, um, I know we have just a few moments left, and I, I do think there is a, a question kind of emerging here for everyone about kind of what is what is process. Uh, and I'm so curious. I know these these readings are oftentimes attended by you know young artists, young poets. Um, so you know, very basic question, but uh, what is your writing process like? What is your translation process right? And can how do they come together? I really like the idea of Rosemary's, you know, a gardener thinking a method uh, of scratching at the earth and collage as a way of almost widening focal with Ranjit, what you're saying about sort of doing Urdu translation. I, I've just scratched that surface and yet I, I, I really value what you're saying there and would love to hear more. Um, I was wondering if maybe we could, and Forrest would love to hear from you as well, sort of uh, can you tell us a little bit about like process behind poem, process behind translation, how the work gets made? Maybe we kick off with Forrest. Thank oh, you. I want to hear from other people. I talk too so much. Yeah. <laughs> Vivi, what about your process for, um, for, yeah, what about your process as a poet? I, I'm the only one here that uh, doesn't uh, translate. So one language, English, um, and that was hard fought for. Um, however, the core of my pedagogy, um, my teaching and my writing uh, has to do with work in translation because work in translation provides a template for the, those liminal spaces, for, the, the, for um, what my husband refers to as the mezzanine. And, um, and that's how my process works. I look 
I love what you said, Rosemary. I look outside of myself um, to see how these things work. So um, I can't imagine not having work in translation. It's at the core of my thinking. How do we speak across languages? But I'm also thinking in terms of the English inside of America. I'm barely understood now that I live in the Northeast. I'm having to constantly shift my language from the Midwest and then from a, being a black Westerner from Texas. All of these things are informing how I speak and I find my own work constantly in the process as a kind of translation so others will understand me. So, uh, so the templates provided for me by writers such as yourselves. Vivi, I really like what what you're saying about about your, you know, essentially describing, you know, that you have your own English, that each of us has our our own English, our own idiolect, and and for me, the the idiolect is is what's so exciting, the fact that each of us speak a slightly different English, some, you know, some to greater degrees than others, but I I think that's that for me is, is really where the most exciting language comes from, those very personal, personal Englishes or, or Spanishes or, or whatever language they are. Um, and in, in terms of my process, I don't think I have anything at all figured out, Malik. I am, you know, always, I, I get distracted from, from my own work. And in part, I think, because like I said, I don't conceptualize of my work as a translator as, as something different than my work as a writer. Although, of course, I can see in, in some sense how it is distinct. Um, but yeah, I think as a person who's really driven by my enthusiasms, um, it, is, it is an effort I have to make to remember to, to work on my own poems, my own projects in progress. And um, that's something, sorry, someone was just knocking on my door and peering in at me. Um, and uh, that's something I'm working on. So I'm eager to hear how, uh, how these other poet translators do it. And Randa, you, you know, uh, as I've, come to learn recently in my relationship with Ashwini Bhatt, um, Indian English is quite different from the English that I grew up with. And there are Indian English, uh, English writing poets like Arvind Krishna Marotta, whose, uh, whose English is very Americanized. He was um, so taken with American poetry. Um, maybe yours a little less so? Yeah, and, I think Arvind, Arvind sorry if I was to interrupt you, you were saying. Uh, and then just also thinking that now your work is also becoming, it's available in the UK, it's becoming, um, you know, uh, you're becoming a more of a presence in the US. How do you think about those Englishes? We have a, a speaking of hybridity, we have an incredibly hybrid set of Englishes, I think. Uh, Arvind has written in a memoir somewhere famously that until he was about 25, he thought he was an American growing up in Allahabad in, <laughs> on the banks of the Ganga, the Ganges. But he at some point came to America. He was in Iowa for a long time. And then that led to a kind of reorientation. But I think for many of us, this is the case for one reason or another. Those of us who are Anglophone have varying relationships with an inherited more British RP kind of English but for the younger generation it's the US is very much the the point of reference but that being said there's a vibrant and vigorous uh, turn towards an indigenous English and there's a lot of linguistic debate about this but the language has a reality and it's in use and it's being being used creatively by lots of practitioners but speaking to to all of these marvelous things that we've been talking about here I really warm to Rosemary's idea of the collage because I found that very very useful even in linguistic terms and really in recent years gave myself the liberty to 
bring in literally phrases, snatches of music, bandish lines from Hindustani classical music, uh, literally importing them into the body of my English poetry to produce this sort of strangeness and otherness and to create a kind of a, a creative friction. Also for me, translation embraces my work in the other arts. I write on the visual arts and I'm a curator. So I learn a great deal from the life of the artist studio as well, whether it's uh, ceramics or installation or collage and montage. So translation for me is also seeing how I can bring some of these techniques over into, into my practice and what I do. Mm -hmm. well, Rosemary, shall we um, ask you maybe to respond and then open up the questions to the audience? Let's open them up right away. Oh. <laughs> I mean, I've already <laughs> talked about my process, you know. <laughs> okay, let's open it up. Yeah. Sure, let's do that. Um, I will say the uh, ever brilliant G.E. Schwartz is a question he's just shared with us, and it's um, quite juicy. It's, has there ever been a theme, a topic you don't want to examine too closely for fear it will fly away? And I think maybe we could even extend this question to, like, you know, is there a theme, a topic that is so inherent you know, that are, you're so, that is so central to what it is you're writing that you didn't realize it um, until, you know, for quite some time. Well, Rosemary mentioned her mother. <laughs> topics, topics we avoid for fear they might fly. Quite poetic. <laughs> Well, those are the topics I want to dive into. You know, sought my whole life to dive into. And uh, a lot of that for me is um, pushing back against the received beliefs and having the courage to push back against received beliefs, really, uh, beliefs around race, um, which is not even a word I really use anymore. And, um, and from any background, it, I don't seem to agree with anyone inside of America. So, <laughs> so. Are there other questions too? I'm sure there are, but that's, that's kind of it for right now. Um, I think, you know, I might also ask, do you have questions for one another that maybe have emerged during this, this hour we've spent together? Mm -hmm. It's all right if not. <laughs> I want to know who everyone's reading right now. <laughs> what is exciting for you right now? I'm reading um, <laughs> Under the Dome, Walks with Paul Salon. Oh my, um, wonderful. And it's, uh, it's by Jean Devy. And it's uh, translated by like a third of the books in translation in the US by Rosemary Waldrop. You're great on hyperbole. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm reading Clarice Lispector uh, and rereading her and reading her slowly. And uh, just, just, I'm overwhelmed by her. She's a wonderful Bra Brazilian writer. Um, of Jewish background, but that doesn't feed much into her work. Um, and uh, her sentences are so amazing. And uh, how she goes into very subtle psychological uh, nuances and then connects them to strange images is just amazing. Which is your favorite book of hers so far? Um, at the moment, it's Apple in the Dark. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But, uh, it's about a man who thinks he has killed his wife and is trying to just sort things out without really succeeding. I, I haven't read yet, that one yet. I've read most of the others that New Directions has published and the Passion According to G.H. Yeah, well, that one is, of the most incredible books I've ever read. That certainly is, yeah. yes. Yeah. It's for the audience that hasn't read this, th this entire novel takes place 
in a corner of an attic uh, between the speaking protagonist and a half dead cockroach <laughs> stuck in a drawer. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that is an amazing book. Rosemary, I think this also makes a lot of sense because um, in, I, I forget who it is who does the translations for New Directions of Clarice Lispector, but the translator, maybe Benjamin Moser, has this line about like the not wanting to prune the pricks, the, the thorns off the cactus in the translation, which is so reminiscent of what you were saying about you know the seams of the collage, the seams of the writing but that's where you see that things are happening. It's just very lovely. I think, you know, we have just a few moments left, but if, you know, maybe we can go around round robin and ask, uh, what is everyone else reading? David, yes. Ranjit, what are you reading these days? Uh, most, of, most of what I have been reading lately is pleasantly, but, but also sadly, as I wish I had more time for reading is uh, the books that I'm editing for, for Phoneme and, and two of the ones that I'm really excited about. One is a book of poems by the Congolese writer, Fiston Mwanza Mujila, who wrote Tram 83. It's called The River in the Belly. Actually, we're doing, doing an event for it as part of the transnational uh, reading series on Saturday. Um, that one was translated from the French by J. Brett Maney. I think it's a, a brilliant book. I think for I know Forrest has, has read it. I'm pretty sure he enjoyed it. And then the the other is a book from Curacao by Radna Fabias, translated from the Dutch by David Colmer. And Radna, she's one of the most amazing poets I've encountered in, in the last several years. And that book will be out um, at the end of this this month. Fantastic. What about um, Vivi? Yeah, what about everyone? Um, Vivi and Ranjit, what are you reading? Come, come forward. I've actually been reading or rereading Alfred Russell Wallace, his journal, journal of his research trip to the Mamale archipelago. I find often that I'm just really um, replenished by reading these accounts and particularly Wallace because he wasn't the wasn't a typical Victorian explorer there was a great deal of sympathy with the communities that he met the places he found himself in his ambiguous role as specimen hunter and uh, early evolutionary scientist it's interesting to sometimes read the grain of the colonial read, read it against itself uh -huh. so that's, but I just, just wanted to say it's interesting. One of the epi, epigraphs to my book, Hunch Prose, is actually from Clarice Vespecta from Agua Viva. So hear me with your whole body. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nice. Oh, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> and what about you, Ivy? What are you reading? Well, I'm looking around my table right now, and I have... Um, groups of uh, historical comic books. <laughs> um, and I, I've just dipped into uh, Sadia Hartman's uh, Wayward uh, Lives, oh, yeah. Beautiful Experiments. And uh, I actually draw a lot of my work from reading outside of poetry, even though I read so much poetry, I do not know why I'm not blind by now. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, this, uh, this set of critical essays, uh, A Life Distilled on Gwendolyn Brooks, because I do not like how she's being written about or spoken about right now. So I, I want to um, add my voice. So, how is she being written about or spoken about right now? What, what well, uh, maternalized, uh -huh. desexualized. Uh -huh. uh, her, how she saw herself being uh, reduced and uh, forgive me for gendering this, but it is true that um, much of the work coming out about her right now is written by men who seem to be utterly terrified of the fulsomeness of her, um, of her identifying herself as woman, as female. Um, and I, I, I don't like it. <laughs> so, oh, was that too harsh? I'm sorry. 
No. Is it? no we, yeah. We need Never it on the up. record and we need it in the archive. And I think there's also a, a really lovely way that the Sidia Hartman and the and the the biography go together. Right? Mm -hmm. The Sidia Hartman about you know all of, all those who are foreclosed outside of 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 kind of society and 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 I think one way we foreclose people historically is by cleaning up the way we tell their their life story um, or making them fit some type of outdated um yeah binary and narrative I, I just i find it just so intolerable yeah truly truly um i think maybe this is a beautiful place for us to close for the afternoon i know ranjit is like past midnight um so thank you all so much <laughs> Vivi, Ranjit, David, Rosemary, and of course, thank you, Forrest, for bringing us all together and opening up the space so beautifully. Uh, what a wonderful fellowship of people. As always, we'll share the recording of today's reading on our online archives as well as on YouTube. Uh, it, so it'll be available in just a few days uh, should ever you want to revisit this magical space. Uh, and we do this every day here at The Rail. So please join us again tomorrow for the fourth publishing in transit led by writer and literary critic Cole Swenson and featuring Ugly Duckling Press. Uh, tomorrow we'll be joined by UDP co-founder Matvey Yankelevich, alongside authors Monica de la Torre, who does some translation herself, and Rachel Levitsky for a conversation on literary publishing. And that will be, as always, at 1 p.m. Eastern right here in the Zoom. Uh, other than that, thank you all so much. And I'll invite you to turn on your microphones if you'd like to say hello to each other, say goodbye on your way out, or anything else that you feel <laughs> compelled. But this has been really beautiful. Thank you uh, for so much generosity. And thank you, Forrest. Thank, thank, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank this you has been Fong, <laughs> <laughs> Nick, thank, thank you. you. And thank you, Malvika, Barbara. you're just the best. Thank you, <laughs> thank you, David. Thank you, David. That's amazing. Thank you, Rosemary. Thank so you. Much, so much wisdom here. So much vulnerability. <laughs> so much clean ankle bohemianism that we need so badly <laughs> right now. <laughs> Freedom, wisdom, and everything else in between. Um, we love poetry here at the rail. It's uh, not tell the, the visual artists, but we put the poets. <laughs> we love you, Fang. Yeah. Thanks, Fang. Great. Thank you so much. Hi, Mama. Hi. Hey, David. I just want to say hello. Long time no see. Yeah. It's great to see your face. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Goodness. How do the two of you know each other? LA. LA. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Wow. That's terrific. Well, listen, let's continue soon. Hopefully, we can organize a real reading here at the real office. But uh, thank you so much, Rosemary, again. And I know that uh, it's time for lunch. We deserve a good lunch. <laughs> uh, we have so much poetic nurturing now. It's, and it's now for real nurturing. Could we have another half a day to go? It's great at the rail here every time that every Wednesday, when the radical poetry reading comes, it restores our entire whole week previously with new energy. Mm. Yep. And the clarity of language have always fortified our strength and our courage to go forward and to be able to be open and vulnerable. That's what we mm. need to do at the rail. So mm. thank you for all of that rhythm of wisdom and vulnerability. Thank you. All right. So, thank you, Fong. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, you guys. Gracias. Bye. Love. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye, David. Bye. 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 Thank, you. Bye. thank you so much. Thank, thank you, everyone. Take care. Love.